Welcome everyone to today's program. I'm Molly Gamble with Becker's Healthcare. The program will begin with a presentation and we will have a question and answer session following completion of the presentation. You can submit any questions you have throughout the presentation by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled Enter a Question for Staff and clicking Send. Our presenters will attempt to answer as many questions as they can during the time we have and will follow up on questions they do not have the opportunity to address. You'll receive an email within about a week following the webinar that will include instructions for how you can download a copy of the presentation. You will also receive a follow-up email shortly after completion of the program. You can submit your feedback or any additional questions at that time. This email will not include the presentation. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's presenters. As General Manager for API Healthcare, a GE healthcare company, Lisa LeBeau is responsible for overseeing the company's overall business operations. Under Lisa's leadership, the company has experienced record growth and consistently receives high honors for industry excellence. Prior to becoming general manager, Lisa held the position of chief, chief operating officer, where her commitment to superior client service and dedication to positive outcomes for clients advanced sales opportunities that enabled API Healthcare to become a leader in workforce optimization technology and services. Lisa is a medical technologist with a bachelor's degree in medical technology from Northern State University in Aberdeen, South Dakota, and she is part of the American Society for Clinical Pathology. Chris Abatey is Chief Nursing Officer at Cedar Park Regional Medical Center in Texas. With over 20 years of nursing leadership experience across multiple health systems, Krista has built her career by continuously improving the patient experience and driving clinical outcomes. Krista obtained her Bachelor of Science degree in nursing from University of Mary Hardin Baylor, a master's degree in healthcare administration from the University of Texas at Arlington, and she is a fellow with the American College of Healthcare Executives. And I'm Molly Gamble, Editor-in-Chief of Becker's Hospital Review. It is my pleasure to kick off today's presentation. Quality of care was never not a priority for hospitals, but new payment models spearheaded by the Affordable Care Act have really reinforced patient outcomes and satisfaction as top priority. To kick off our discussion today, we're going to start with an overview of three different events and programs that are really lighting a fire under hospitals to comprehensively support quality of care and the patient experience. The hospital value-based purchasing program is one payment mechanism that has really renewed the energy and focus behind quality of care. The program was phased in in 2013 under the ACA, and it's intended to encourage hospitals to provide high-quality care more efficiently. It incentivizes this by adjusting Medicare payments based on the quality of care hospitals provide. So under the VBP, the quality of care is a blend of patient outcomes and patient satisfaction. Each hospital gets a score, and 12 process of care measures make up 70% of that score, while eight patient experience measures account for 30%. So those patient experience measures include things pertaining to nurse communication, physician communication, the responsiveness of staff in the hospital, and information that patients receive when they're discharged. The program funds itself by adjusting Medicare payments to hospitals. So in fiscal year 2016, base DRG payments were reduced by 1.75% to fund an estimated 1.5 billion in incentive payments for the program. The thing is though, the worst performing hospitals do not recoup any of that reduction. So that 1.75% is not theirs to gain back. It's gone for good. And at a time when many hospitals face tight margins, and financial pressure, that 1.75% reduction is not painless. It's really something hospitals are paying close attention to and avoiding. Next slide, please. So the value-based purchasing program is a couple years old by now, but this past winter we saw both public and private payers move more aggressively to tie payments to quality of care. In January, the Department of Health and Human Services unveiled its new goal for virtually all Medicare payments to be tied to quality and value. Sylvia Matthews Burwell set some specific benchmarks. So the department wants 85% of Medicare payments tied to quality in 2016, and that will move up to 90% by 2018. 
And just a few days after HHS announced this, we saw a private sector alliance, including some of the biggest names in healthcare, commit to put 75% of their business in the next five years into value-based payment arrangements. Uh, United Health Group is one that stood out. So as part of this effort, executives said they want to increase value-based payments to doctors and hospitals by 20% in 2015, and that amounts to more than $43 billion. That number is expected to grow in the following years, and United Healthcare, given its size, and its presence is really considered a crystal ball of sorts for the health insurance industry. So this decision and this movement makes the strategy all the more salient for providers. Next slide, please. So there's major push to align provider payments to care quality and the patient experience uh, as the VDP program, the new Medicare goals, and United Health strategy illustrate very well. This is driving a lot of the leaders to re-examine their workforce strategies and what resources they can deploy to better support patient outcomes and satisfaction. A hospital staff is a critical, critical, critical component of the patient experience, and there's a growing body of research connecting patient outcomes, quality of care, and the patient experience to staffing variables. So Lisa Labu is going to explore this connection further and share a few statistics with you. Thanks, Molly. It is great to be part of this webinar and discussing the statistics around staffing and how we can really impact the patient outcomes. And, you know, as an operations person at heart, you know, I really like to see how all the pieces of the puzzle really fit together. And as more and more of this research comes to play out, we're able to link this to the staffing variables and link this to the patient outcomes. It's really becoming more apparent that there are needs uh, needs to be a way to operationalize the staffing processes in ways that make sense that, that it's possible for evidence to help drive better staffing that happens to, to make it easier for every day and every shift. We know staffing is a tough, tough job. We must make it easier for our healthcare leaders, for our unit managers, for our staff coordinators. This is a tough job. They need to have the data, they need to have data-driven staffing decisions in order to make a difference. So let's go on to the next slide and take a look at some statistics. All right, so you know, when you talk about overtime, there's always been that traditional view um, specifically around workforce, and it's always been kind of exclusively around reducing overtime and the, the savings that you have, um, the cost savings. Which, which is a good thing as well. Um, but what the statistics here are showing is really kind of linking up how those uh, possible outcomes really uh, connect with overtime as well. Um, specifically, if we take a closer look at this first statistic, you know, studies are showing that it's 3.7 times more likely um, to have that medical error occur when working overtime. So these are pretty significant statistics and something that we need to pay closer attention to. Next slide. Next, I think there's a, you know, an important part about looking at your statistics around the staffing levels, your skill mix, and your on shift. And so we have some stats around here and some of the data and the research that's coming to play. But decisions about how many staff are working and their skills and their experience um, connected to the care um, of those caregivers really have a significant impact of those patient of the patient outcomes that we're trying to drive, as you can see in both of these two statistics. Next slide. And I think lastly, I wanted to land on satisfaction. Um, satisfaction is really playing a key role as well. And satis staff satisfaction is definitely having a direct link into patient satisfaction. And you can definitely see this um, as the employee engagement has a direct correlation, correlation in the HCAP scores um, that we're seeing in our research as well. Next slide. So next, uh, recognizing that uh, the staffing variables can really in impact those patient outcomes, um, we teamed up with uh, Becker's Healthcare to survey um, healthcare executives to better understand how we're aligning with their organizations and goals and their workforce management strategies and initiatives. So now I'll hand it back over to Molly to, to explore the survey results. Thanks, Lisa. 
Uh, yes, we polled 95 healthcare leaders in late spring and early summer, and we asked them about their organizational goals and the workforce management techniques they were putting to use. So we're going to share some of the major findings of this survey with you today. So you can see how hospital leaders are crafting their workforce management strategies and what techniques they're deploying most. Also, we did identify some caveats and disconnects. What hospitals are doing to support their workforce does not always align with their goals. And we're going to dig deeper into those gaps as well today. Next slide, please. So to bounce off of what Lisa was uh, talking about, the patient experience, we found the patient experience is really a significant driver for many hospitals' workforce management strategies today. 64% uh, of executives said the patient experience has influenced their strategy the most over the past two years. And as, as for good reason, I think as Lisa illustrated, there's a growing body of research on how hospitals and how they develop, schedule, and engage their employees, and how that really can affect clinical outcomes, medical errors, and patient satisfaction. So it was interesting to see patient experience is really being taken seriously in these strategies. Next slide, please. And as this next chart shows, this was interesting in that traditionally a hospital's workforce management strategy was driven by productivity and labor costs. You wanted to boost productivity and drive down labor costs as much as you could. But as you can see here, those are two, very, two of the very top drivers still. But we see the patient experience emerging as a strong number three. In fact, it's neck and neck there with reducing labor costs. The respondents really are seeing patient experience as equally influential on their strategy. Uh, it's driving a, a larger portion of the workforce management strategy um, with both neck and neck with labor cost at 51% of respondents there indicated as much. Next slide, please. So next in the survey, we dug a bit deeper and we asked leaders to name the workforce management techniques that they feel are the most supportive of three things, clinical outcomes, medical errors, and patient satisfaction. So first up, we're going to take a look at clinical outcomes here. When we asked leaders to choose the two workforce management tactics they consider most influential on clinical outcomes, staffing, skill, and competency mix really led the way. Nearly 70% of leaders said it had the largest impact. So deploying the proper staffing, skill, and competency mix requires short-term and long-term decision making. In the short term, your staffing plans need to be based on the optimal skill mix to really balance patient safety, care needs, and budget constraints, all while ensuring patient satisfaction. And in the long term, decisions need to be made to determine how to recruit, retain, and develop a workforce with the right competencies and skills to meet both current and future demands. Next slide, please. So we saw staff skill and competency come up again with medical errors as well. When we asked leaders to name the tactics they consider most influential to reduce medical errors and never events, the majority of them, 68%, again chose staff and skill and competency mix. Next slide. And then finally, staff satisfaction here emerged as a management tactic that really yields the most noticeable results on patient satisfaction but staffing skill and competency was still a very close second there with a 2% difference between the two. So this survey, as we found, staffing skill and competency mix and staff satisfaction are really two of the most prominent management techniques that leaders are deploying. Uh, the next thing we saw made us do a bit of a double take, however. So let's take a look at what that was. Next slide. So this is where we begin to see a bit of a gap. So although staffing skill and competency mix and staff satisfaction were the two workforce management strategies hospital leaders emphasized the most to us, they are also the two strat strategies that receive the least amount of support from software, data, and automation. So although 70% of leaders said staff skill and competency have the largest effect on clinical outcomes, only a third of them use workforce management software for it. And then also, 56% of respondents said staff satisfaction was the management tactic most influential on patient satisfaction, but only 19% have automated this. You can see over time there is the management tactic receiving the most support from technology, and we're going to talk about that too in a little bit. 
Next slide, please. So from evidence to action, where is the disconnect? Even though hospital leaders identify certain tactics as the most likely to improve clinical outcomes, reduce medical errors, and boost patient satisfaction, many are not leveraging the data, the software, and the consistency to optimize those very tactics. So we're going to talk about three of the most interesting disconnects we detected based on the survey results that came in. Next slide. So over time, this is the one that you saw is a tactic that's most data-driven and, and automated based on responses from the hospital leaders we surveyed. But interestingly, over time, it's hardly seen as having an impact on the patient experience. Even though 51% of respondents said they have software that enables the monitoring and management of overtime, few hospital leaders correlated overtime with the patient experience. Only 26% said overtime affects patient satisfaction, 17% said overtime influences the rate of medical errors, and 14% said it affects clinical outcomes. So studies have supported a link between overtime and patient outcomes Working more than 40 hours a week and working voluntary paid overtime are both significantly related to adverse events and errors affecting both patients and nurses. Another study found medication errors and hospital-acquired infections were each more than three times as likely when nurses work more than 40 hours a week. Lisa highlighted a lot of these statistics in her portion of the presentation. So it's interesting to note, though, that the one tactic really the most supported through data and technology is the one leaders see as less impactful on the patient experience. Next slide, please. And on the flip side, while most hospital leaders find staff skill and competency mix as highly influential on clinical outcomes, reducing errors, and improving patient satisfaction, you can see here how little automation and technological support this tactic is receiving. Only 33% of respondents said their organization uses automation to support staff skill and competency mix. So there also seems to be a disconnect between the short and long-term goals. Even though staff competency is critical, only 13% of respondents said competency development is a primary goal for their workforce management strategy. Um, so the takeaway here is there is a disconnect. Leaders really consider staff skill mix as something critical to the patient experience, yet many do not support it with data and many have not made it a cornerstone of their long-term workforce strategy either. Next slide, please. So next up is staff satisfaction. Um, most survey respondents really see the link between a satisfied staff and a satisfied patient. They told us that staff satisfaction is a workforce management tactic with the biggest impact on patient satisfaction. And studies support this, as Lisa illustrated earlier, um, for instance, the number of people who would definitely recommend a hospital on their HCAP survey, that decreases 2% for every 10% of nurses at a hospital who say they're dissatisfied with their jobs. So it's a very interesting and cause, uh, correlated relationship between the two. And there's also a cost component here. Uh, turnover, training, and recruitment are costly. Uh, the nurse turnover costs are about 1.3 times the salary of a departing nurse and for a hospital or a health system that can add up very quickly. But despite this evidence, fewer than one in five survey respondents use technology to manage staff engagement. Uh, some respondents said they were not aware of automation tools for staff satisfaction, and others said that staff satisfaction is important to them, but it falls behind in a world of competing priorities in the day to day. And next slide, please. The team at Cedar Park Regional Medical Center has leveraged their staffing technology to improve patient satisfaction and staff engagement. And at the same time, they've been able to cut their labor costs by millions of dollars. So now Chris Abadi, the CNO at Cedar Park, will share how they were able to accomplish this. Thank you. And I always get excited when I get to, get to tell our story. Um, next slide, please. Um, we are just outside of Austin, Texas, which is the capital here. Um, we are among, we are actually identified as the fourth fastest growing city and county within the U.S. Um, we are in a very highly competitive market. We have five hospitals within a 10 mile radius that consist of three other hospital systems. So it's very important for us to create an environment uh, where people want to come and work here. 
We employ over 550 healthcare professionals, um, not only in our hospital, but in our clinics out in the community. Next slide, please. So what we discovered is that we weren't utilizing our staff or our scheduling component to the best of our ability. People are your most important assets, but you have to be able to schedule them, get them here, and for everybody to know kind of what's going on. When I joined the organization three years ago, um, we identified early on that we had patient safety concerns, quality care concerns, um, we've had decrease in our employee engagement, and we had a very high use of contract labor that were filling our scheduling gaps. Um, if you go back to the first slide of the whole, um, whole presentation, you saw that 70% patient outcomes and 30% patient satisfaction, and so we had um, a decrease in both of those that we were ultimately going to get paid or not paid for. Next slide, please. We saw a significant surge in contract labor. So if you back, look back at our story from March through May of 12 when we conducted this audit, we had a 53% increase in our contract labor spend as compared to the year previous to that. We were using at least 30 full-time contract labor employees to fill our gaps across the whole organization. And so we saw an increase in our adverse events that include mislabeling, mishaps, uh, medication various variances and increase in patient complaints. As we look and drill deep into those, 75% of those adverse events included um, or re were related to agency staff. Next slide, please. So what did we plan to do about it? How are we going to partner together to make sure that we could eliminate um, contract labor, uh, increase patient satisfaction, increase um, employee satisfaction. I will tell you that this is the most important piece of this, is the collaborative partnership. It was a partnership with um, our CFO and his financial team, myself as the CNO and the nursing leadership team. It has to be that partnership. Um, basically, the way I look at it, the CFO has the money. I need the money to be able to um, um, do what we need to do clinically, and he needs to know why I need that. And so we worked really closely together um, so that he understood why it was that we needed to move forward with, um, with increasing our technology and the way that we were using it. So we worked with that team so that we could really proactively fill our shifts further ahead of time, that we weren't waiting till the last minute to fill those. Um, we wanted to use our internal resources, make sure that we had those internal resources and that we could communicate them with them effectively before we had to go to outside and external um, agency use. With this program, we also implemented the rewards program to help fill our open shifts. So there was some incentive for scheduling early, getting all the shifts filled before we actually posted the um, final schedule. Next slide, please. So we do consider it a win for everyone. Um, the scheduling program offered um, staff satisfaction as well as incentive for the staff to pick up those shifts. And I will tell you, as we have really embarked on an intense recruitment program, high-performing staff in this market, they ask those questions. They want to be in control of their schedule. They ask about self-scheduling. They want to know how that works, how that is communicated. And so they ask that, those questions when we are interviewing them. Uh, we were able to reduce our agency spend, so that uh, ultimately increased our bottom line, so that is much healthier. And we were able to reduce our contract labor, so not only were our patients more satisfied, we had fewer errors, so it increased our patient safety and our quality. And um, our staff were more satisfied as well because they were working with people who are their own and were not contract labor staff. Next slide, please. As you know, everything we look at, we want it to be measurable. And so from during this time, if we look back at 2012, and when this was, um, we really looked at this in 2014, we had 31% increase in our organizational engagement. So our staff said to us, um, we would recommend this organization as one of the best places to work at a 29% increase. 13% of those were satisfied with this organization as a place to work. 
So even if we, as I was doing my nurse leader rounding and rounding on staff, I would hear uh, things such as, it's, it's so much better, I know who I'm working with, we have our, our, um, our shifts filled. They knew who they were working with, they knew the shifts were filled, but they also had that constant communication. They weren't waiting until the last minute. As a chief nursing officer, if you ask most of them what keeps them up at night, they will tell you that it is staffing. I can say now that that is not what keeps me up at night because we've got a product in place, we've got a process that goes with that product uh, to ensure that our, our shifts are filled and that we are able to staff for whatever census that we have. Next slide, please. So our patient experience. Um, we were able to reduce our patient complaints by 61% in two months. That was huge. I had a revolving door. Phone calls were, were coming in where I would have patient complaints, staff complaints, uh, physician complaints. And so if, if your patients are not happy, then your surgeons and your physicians aren't happy. And so um, I knew that we had to do something. We had better management of our mislabeling in all of our events, and so we saw a significant decrease um, in our quality and an increase in patient safety and also in staff safety. We saw that rolling it all together that we could make a difference in the way that we um, took care of our patients and the way that we handled our staff. As I said earlier in the presentation, your people are your most important asset, and so it is my responsibility, our responsibility as nursing leaders to make sure that they have the tools and the resources that they need to do their job. And so this was one way that um, we as an organization could ensure that they had the resources that they need and that we had the resources to take care of those patients. Molly, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Great, thank you, Krista. And thank you, Lisa, too, earlier for a very informative uh, presentation. So we're going to now begin the Q&A portion of the program. Uh, as a reminder, you can submit any questions you have by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled Enter a Question for Staff and clicking Send. Our presenters will attempt to answer as many questions as they can during the time we have for the Q&A, and we'll follow up on questions we do not have the opportunity to address. So Krista, a few questions have already come in. This first one here is for you. Um, can you talk more about how you were able to use your existing staffing solution to do more for your organization? What features and functionality did you tap into to achieve your results? So there were several, um, several things that we used. Um, the number one thing is that we were able to get our staff scheduled early, um, and we, we knew where the holes were and what shifts we needed to fill. Um, the second thing was we encouraged, and that's the way the program works, is self-scheduling. So um, electronic notification goes out to all of the staff when the schedule is open so that they can begin putting in their schedules, and notification whenever um, it's closed so that they can begin to start looking for that final, that final schedule. The other thing was it really, uh, we were able to put in and, and know that it only allows certain uh, skill mixes to work together, and it only allows um, the unit to schedule what is required number of staff for that shift. So, you know, when you're doing it on pencil and paper, like we've always done in the past, um, there'd be seven nurses that signed up and you really only needed five for one department. And so it only allows you to, to staff the number of people that, that you need for that shift. And then the last thing is, is the incentive program. We have really um, capitalized on the incentive program. If we do get into a situation where we have shifts that we are not able to fill, difficult shifts, or shifts where we have a serious increase in census or we've had a significant call-ins, um, then we're able to use that incentive program and take it a step further. So there is incentive. We developed the program around where you had incentives. The earlier that you scheduled, the more points you got for that shift. Um, the closer it got to the shift, then um, the less points that you got. And so they encouraged, it really encouraged and incentivized people to sign up early for their shifts. That way we knew where our holes were and we could anticipate those and get those filled. If we get into a situation where it's a critical shift, we can bump up those points um, to incentivize people to work. It also helps us to keep an eye on our 
overtime so that we know exactly who's in overtime. If you get in a situation where um, your census goes down and you need to flex people off, it shows you who those folks are that are in overtime, uh, who your PRN folks that you are that need to go home first. Um, and also we've, we've identified our agency staff if we have any working during that time that those are identified as well. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so Lisa, I'm going to ask you to take this next one here. Um, it pertains to st statistics. Uh, are there more statistics that show the connection between staffing and outcomes? We're trying to make that case to our senior leadership and we'd love to have more data to present. Yeah, there, there's definitely, um, I, I'm a data person and uh, our team has just definitely been, you know, combing on, on data and statistics. So we do have, um, there's a white paper with um, some really good statistics that we've done that's called Lessing the Negative Impacts on Human Factors. Um, so that, uh, we can definitely get this white paper out to you because it will um, have all the resources around these statistics. Um, the ones that we've talked about here today, um, and even the survey results that we've talked about. So I think it'll be a great uh, tool for you to take a, a closer and deep dive as you begin to, you know, put uh, information together for your senior leadership to, um, you know, help, you know, build that story of how you can make a difference. And, and it's about driving that difference, you know, not only um, you, we, we have to drive it for, you know, patient outcomes, but I think it's that balancing act, you know, to me, it's always that triangle of balancing um, patience with your engagement, as, as Krista was talking about, as well as, you know, financial. So there's the three things that you have to balance. You can't focus on one. That wouldn't be good, but focusing on all three. So we can get that white paper out to you all. That's great. Yeah, and also the statistics I mentioned, too, anything uh, in the presentation was contained in the survey results and the ebook that we put together with, with API it's available as well. Another question that came in here is, in what ways are you seeing health systems adjust their workforce management strategies to improve the patient experience? Lisa, would you like to tackle this one first? Yeah, I mean, um, so there's, there's a couple different ways as, um, as Krista, I mean, I, I think the rewards program has really been a big hit of, you know, it's really uh, puts the incentive in the right place. Um, you know, I think engaging and uh, making sure you're, as Krista talked about, and I'll let her kind of refer to it, I, I know even for myself, I like to make my own decisions. And so allowing your staff to make, you know, the decisions that they want to make around their own scheduling really improves their satisfaction. And we see these in the statistics. If they're happy, it really is going to have a direct impact over to the patients and driving that satisfaction to your patients as well. Wonderful. Kristen, is there anything else you wanted to add? Any other strategies um, either that you're putting to use or your colleagues are putting to use to adjust workforce management strategies with the patient experience that are balanced with two? Um, yes. So it, it's just what she said. It's For us, it's all about culture. Because we're in such a competitive market that you first have, market, you have to first um, develop that culture, and that's what we've worked on for the last three years. But with that, comes the ability as, as we're dealing in, in healthcare with five generations, people still want to make their own decisions. And so me being able to say when I want to work um, is, huge, is huge for a nurse. And so making sure that you um, make that available to them. Uh, the other piece is that cost, constant communication. Um, they don't want to have to wait until they come, I worked Monday night, I don't want to have to wait till I come back to do my weekend shift on Friday to find out um, the next schedule is open and um, all of the shifts that I'm available to work um, have already been taken. So that communication goes out via text message or email uh, immediately um, to know that it's open and I have control over when I want to work um, with, with boundaries, with limitations. And, and so the that, that's the biggest piece of it is, is the um, control over my own schedule and then the incentive, incentive program. Mm -hmm. If your folks are happy, ultimately your patients are going to be happy. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, another question that came in, I'll, I'll take a stab at this one first. Um, an audience member asked, why do you think there was such a large disconnect between the strategies that the survey respondents 
thought would be effective and what they were actually doing to implement the strategies. We did do a follow-up. Uh, we did for respondents. We asked a few follow-up questions with them um, to kind of dig deeper and explore why there was that gap that we discussed. And we found a couple common causes. So one is just kind of the silos of many organizations. Um, a lot of respondents said there's a lack of coordination between hospital departments. Um, so some uh, competency and talent management still reside in the HR department of a hospital, even though each clinical area is responsible for implementing them. So there's a disconnect where HR is kind of serving as the central hub, but then um, the clinical areas are implementing these on their own, which can, can cause some, um, some disconnect and some disparities. Uh, something else that came up was staff satisfaction when we asked why that was such a, a goal that was not being um, automated or there wasn't a lot of data being put toward it. Uh, it turns out that it just kind of depends on the financial stability of the organization. So one respondent said, um, in the current state, staff satisfaction is a distant third to number one, the patient experience, and number two, keeping the doors open. So when you have the number two is to keep the doors open, it's really a tough um, situation. And I guess based on that response, it's not a surprise to see that it would be upheld as a very critical goal and not really pursued as aggressively. Um, and then something else that came up too was just uh, the leadership, the culture of leadership. So there's some organizations where senior leaders are really supportive of a more mature, sophisticated workforce management techniques, while others are still relying on, uh, the in, they're in the infancy stages and still maybe using turnover as their main reporting metric to measure staff satisfaction. So um, it turns out that a lot, the chief human resource officer said that she would kind of attribute some gaps that we saw in the survey to the culture of organizations and how seriously leaders um, really take these initiatives. Lisa and Krista, if there's anything you wanted to add to that. Yeah, this is Krista. I'll, I'll go back exactly to the, to the culture that I um, discussed earlier. Um, when I joined here three years ago, um, we had a, as I discussed, a significant turnover in our staff, not only in our staff, but in our leadership. And so before we could even uh, really embark on um, our, our workforce strategy, um, I had to stabilize the, the nursing leadership. And so I knew in order to do that that I was going to have to get in there and really get my um, hands dirty to find out what were the issues, what, what did we need to do, what were the staff looking for, why were they leaving. And so I think it's a um, really a self-assessment of your organization. Um, it's easy for us to sit in our executive offices and, and think about what it is that our team needs. Um, but until we get out there and we actually ask, ask them, what is it that you really need? What is it that you really want? Um, then you really can start to develop your culture. Um, but it is about the culture and, and asking the questions about what is it that you need and that you want. Mm -hmm. Chris, a lot of questions are coming in about the rewards program, uh -huh. um, about, how you, about how you structured it, um, about one, <coughs> excuse me, so, the incentive reward program. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Do you have a, do you have a cap on it? Um, I guess if you can dive into further details about how you structured it, if there's a cap on the rewards, um, any other specifics that attendees might be able to take away if they're looking to do something similar. Absolutely. So there are two ways that you can set up your incentive program. Your rewards part of it. Um, API does have a catalog where um, employees can go directly in and um, select their reward and it gets sent directly to them. We went a different route to begin with. We were exploring other options at this time, but we have um, all, if there are extra points that are, award, that are awarded, all of them have to be signed out, off by the director and by myself. And then at the end of the month, um, staff can turn in um, their rewards um, for what they want. And so we have a sheet that they fill out that they can get um, movie tickets, lunch tickets, um, gift cards from several different um, department stores, grocery stores. It's interesting, uh, probably 75% of ours are the, the local HEB grocery store. Um, and then they go all the way up to um, 
to Southwest Airlines tickets. And so that's the mm -hmm. max. Um, we do cap it at 200,000. You can only keep 200,000 points in your, um, in your bank at any time. Um, and I think it, I think it comes out to each point as each point is worth 0 0.005 cents. I'll have to go back and look at that to make sure, but it's somewhere right around there. Um, so it's typically less than you would pay monetarily for a critical shift bonus, if you will, and they get to get something in return. Um, and so we do have a cap. Um, we do have specific guidelines around. Um, around how the rewards are used. We also incentivize perfect attendance. Um, and so for a quarter, you can turn in um, a sheet for perfect attendance. Um, but there are certain criteria around that. And it's not that every employee um, gets it every single quarter. But it's, you know, if you request PTO during that time, you're not eligible. You have to work so many hours during, um, you have to have to already pre-scheduled so many hours be in that six-week period, um, and so we keep an eye on um, on those. You also have to be here for 90 days out of your introductory period before you collect start collecting points. Okay, great. And then a question came in: uh, What your typical nurse to patient ratio on a general med surge unit is? Do you know know what that is? I do. So um, our goal is to be one to five. Um, I will tell you that during high census, we typically can go one to six. Okay, thank you. Uh, this question, I, I'd be curious to hear um, your feedback if, since you did this directly, but how monitoring over time can affect staff feeling micromanaged. Uh, and that was in quotes. That was asked by an attendee. Is that one for me too? Yeah, for you. And then if Lisa would like to, to chime in as well. So in Texas, we have um, the, the nursing board governs how many hours um, a nurse can work in a row. In a row. And so um, it helps us just to monitor that so that we're um, not putting, in pe getting pe putting people in jeopardy. And so mm -hmm. we just want to make sure that our staff is kept safe, but our patients are also kept safe as well. Um, and so they don't look at it as micromanaging. Um, we don't we don't have an issue here as far as people getting into that point where the board would start looking at that. Um, to, our staff know the rules, um, and they, they work overtime, but it's just that they don't work so many hours in a row um, to get us into trouble. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, Lisa, Lisa, I, think you, I think that was well said. Um, you know, I think, uh, I think what you guys have done really is really ideal is I think people will not feel micromanaged if good communications around this and if you can have the visibility enough in time because um, you know with tools and systems you can see that that over time um, way in ahead of it and then you can that is then can be discussed and you can um, have that change happen and be able to uh, manage around that. And there's some questions coming in here about more specifics about the, the, pro, the staffing products, the tools that you put to use to do this. Um, so Lisa and Krista, if you can dive into a little bit more detail about that, I think that would be helpful for folks too. Lisa, you want to go first? Um, sure, sure. So, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, tools, uh, you know, are, uh, I was, you know, tools are a great thing. You know, a scheduling tool, it helps you begin to um, get, visibility um, to your systems um, across the board and be able to uh, connect up your uh, um, connect up your your qualified staff that can uh, take on appropriate shifts and as Krista talked about earlier one of the biggest things around scheduling is allowing to open that up to your staff to be able to take the shifts that they want and make their choices themselves so this is really key and critical as well um, as you have the ability to take a look at and see over time that's going to occur because you're able to see the shift that they've already worked and you can see the shift that they're going to work, you can already see and predict that over time is going to happen and that can have um, both a financial impact as well as, as we've seen in the, today's um, webinar, st statistics around patient outcomes as well. 
So this will allow you to see that over time from happening and you can be able to make that change. Um, as well as be able to see the ability to fill the needs. You know, we know that census goes up and down and, and you have a need to fill a shift. As you may be calling someone off, they have the skill set to actually be filled in another area. So you're still making them satisfied as far as being able to put them in, the, in, in each place. So, and I'll just add on to that. So we have a, a staffing office and, and a house supervisor that, that really does our day-to-day, -day, um, helps us fill our day-to-day -day staffing needs. And so we huddle every morning um, at 8.30 and 8.30 in the evening, and we are looking ahead at, at at least seven days out of staffing. So um, if a, for some reason a director has published a um, schedule that had a hole, say, next Saturday night, we know on Monday morning at 8.30, that collaboratively we are going to look ahead at Saturday night. She's already started calling her folks, trying to get um, her staff to fill it, but there may be a person in another department, since this may be low in another department, that we could float somebody to, to that unit to help during that shift. And so when we huddle at 8.30, we're able to bring up the whole program and be able to see hospital-wide um, what it looks like. Okay, great. Thank you both. Uh, I'm looking through questions here. A lot have poured in. Um, Lisa, this one is for you. We have 17 specialty clinics in our region. Is there some data to support outpatient ambulatory shift management? Yeah, I saw that question come through, and I, you know, that's a great question, and it's actually something where I, I'd like to say stay tuned. Maybe we can have another webinar coming up here. It's very important. Um, you know, we, uh, on the acute side, we have a lot of great, we have to be able to, on the ambulatory side as well, have those statistics and be able to, because the workforce is across the, across the board in a health system. So um, I hear you very much, and it's very uh, top of mind for us um, as well in the ambulatory space. We need to be able to be able to manage our workforce as well. Okay, thank you. And Krista, a couple came in specific to scheduling and your policies. Uh, do your employees have a tool for changing the schedule once it's been made? Yes, they are responsible. If the schedule, if the final schedule has already been posted, it is their responsibility to get it covered. And so um, they they can go to their director um, and let them know that they uh, have changed their shift. The director is the only one that, after it's publicized, the final is publicized. The director is the only one that is able to schedule to uh, to change that schedule. I see. Okay. And how about a policy regarding the number of weekends per schedule period? So our nursing staff is uh, it's a it's a department by department policy, but in our med surge unit or critical care areas, they are required to work every other weekend, and so you are able to see. Um, if that is if that is occurring for our full-time staff, you can easily bring it up and look at it to ensure that they are um, that they are meeting their obligation. Mm -hmm. uh, for our PRN staff, whatever the requirement is for them, you can you can pull it up and look at it easily. You can look at the whole units department. Uh, you can you can look at the whole unit schedule, or you can bring up an individual person. So if I wanted to see what my charge nurse shifts were this week, that um, Jane Doe was working, I could just click on her profile and it tell, would tell me what her schedule was this week so that I could make sure and go round on her this week. Um, there are different reports that you can run as well um, and notes that you can put in so that if uh, a director is going to be out for a few days on PTO that anybody um, leadership wise that looks in there can say, you know, I've kept this extra person because we're going live with this new system today or um, please don't cancel uh, Jane, because she's precepting uh, a new a new staff member. You can put notes mm -hmm. in there as well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, an attendee says it is offered by some that staff satisfaction is correlated to leadership performance. What do you notice in the data regarding this idea, and how do you at Cedar Park help leadership deliver high performance? So I, I'm a firm believer um, in, in relationships, and so as I said before, the uh, turnover in our leadership was, was 
unbelievable when I first got here. And so as we began to develop our team, um, I had to look for high-performing leaders um, and not just somebody that had maybe been a leader in the past, but somebody who had experience, was competent, and had uh, great references. Um, they also have to know that as, and I will tell you that at this, this whole piece of it is definitely CNO driven, that you have to build that team and the leadership team has to let staff know that they've got their back, that they're doing what they can to ensure that um, the shifts are filled, that they're going to have the adequate number of techs to help them um, take care of their patients. And so um, it's really about that culture and building the team um, to ensure that we we're we're all in this together, and that's my motto. Mhm. Mm Absolutely. So we are about have about six more minutes left here. Um, we are going to be sending out I'm sorry the white paper and the ebook that we had mentioned um, throughout that contains some statistics that were mentioned earlier in the presentation, and we're still taking questions. So if you do have questions, please feel free to submit them um, in the control panel area there. Um, let's see here. So Krista, another one that's come in here. How do you adjust intraday staffing levels based on changing patient acuity? So um, if at any point during the day we see that our census is, is going up significantly or going down significantly, we will, we will um, call a huddle to say how can we adjust to that. If we have somebody on call, we will definitely call that person in. The administrative supervisor, health supervisor can do that. Um, and so we do ad adjust um, based on our um, um, levels during the day. I think that there was um, a question about a piece of that that was about acuity. Um, so I will tell you that um, there, is a, a, there is an acuity piece of API that we are um, currently looking at, been, been um, talking with them and looking that over the past couple of months. And so we are investigating um, that piece, we still do acuity on pen and paper, um, and so that's the next step for us. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you have a tool that monitors staffing every four hours? So we, we are looking at staffing even more often than that. Um, that is why we wow. have the administrative supervisor that functions in that role. Um, it is their responsibility to make sure that they are rounding on each of the units and um, um, monitoring that. At any point that a charge nurse feels that they have had an increase or a decrease, we've also, they know that they are, it is their responsibility to call, to call the administrative supervisor so that we can adjust accordingly. I saw a question that came in about um, maternity, LDR, um, uh, OB, mother, baby, and the variables that you have in that. ED is the same way. Uh, we have a core staffing model, um, and so we staff to that core, and then we adjust on a daily basis based on census. So even in our emergency department, if we have our core staffing that is here, we know that all the shifts are filled, but if at 4 a.m. in the morning we've got five patients in the ED, then we can flex somebody off um, knowing that there is going to be a new set of folks that come in at 7 a.m. Mm -hmm. Same way with women's services. On the weekend, we don't staff as many L&D nurses as we staff um, during the week when we are doing scheduled procedures. Okay, great. Some other questions have come up about, and this might not be your real house, Krista, um, but I'll ask this, but about behavioral health and mental health acuity. Um, is there any differences in, in staffing those departments and how that might be handled differently? So, we do not have a psych unit here. We um, actually hold those mental health patients in the ED until they can be placed somewhere. And so um, we do have security staff that sits with those patients if they are, have been deemed a harm to themselves or to others. Um, and then our staff usually have a lesser um, patient mix than they would if they had just um, other patients that didn't have that um, going on. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really remarkable how many questions came in about the incentives and the rewards program, but maybe you can just go, dive a little deeper into the range of um, rewards that are available. 
Uh, so whether that's a bonus, PTO, um, or whether it's more tangible items like you mentioned, airline tickets and such. Um, ours is tangible. Um, we do change it up about every six months. We'll take the rewards that are on the sheet. And I'm happy to share that with anyone. I can send it to you guys and you can send it out with the packet. Um, it's interesting because people want something that they can hold in their hand, um, that they can mm -hmm. physically, typically physically touch. And so um, ours is really around gift certificates, restaurant gift certificates. Like I said, our local grocery store is probably 75% of our rewards that are turned in. And then there are people who, um, um, we have some international nurses that we have recruited that are full-time nurses for us, but once a year, or once every two years, they want to go back and visit um, home. And, and so not even international, but even if they are from California, then they'll save up all their points and purchase um, an airline ticket so that they can travel, or they're saving it for their vacation. Um, that kind of thing. So ours are very, ta very tangible. Okay. And did they receive so points? Lisa, I thought I would. Oh, oh sorry. I thought oh, I would ahead, just chime in on just talking about um, kind of the rewards, you know, overall, and as I see um, our clients and using them. And yes, they are, you know, very. It's the tangible. It's the, it's the things. Even as you out there, you may be used to you know, seeing the American Express points. It's similar to that that concept. You have, as Krista talked about earlier, it's it's a point system, and we're seeing that it drives the behavior that you want, um, and, and the satisfaction. The satisfaction is much you know, higher um, based on having that versus putting money in, in the account. So it's uh, been quite a, it's a great thing. And um, being able to connect that is uh, driving the results that you want to see. So Lisa, you've seen the tangible items be the most popular in other organizations as well? Um, Pretty much, that's that's majority. I would say it's on the high, upward 80 percent. Okay. Yep. A big Great. majority. Great. So we have, looks like we have time for about one more question here. Um, let's see here. So Krista, this one came in for you about staffing policies once more. How do your staffing policies differ for single skill versus multi skill employees? Can you can you say that question again? Sure. How do your staffing policies differ for single skill versus multi skill employees? So, if there are multi skill employees, we have them, if they're able to float to another unit, we have them in a different group um, in, the, in the scheduling program. So, they're in a home unit, but they are also um, in, in whatever unit that they can float to. So, when we're looking at who might be available to staff an open shift and their home is another unit, then we look at what other units that they could be floated to. And so there is a category that we use for that. And the nice thing about this product is um, you can set it up um, pretty much any way that you want. Um, if you need a certain number of techs, if you need a certain number of um, nurses, you, you set that up. You, and you set up the hours that you need them as well. Um, so it's very tailorable to the individual organization. Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you, Krista, and thank you, Lisa. Uh, I want to again thank you for your excellent presentation and for all of our attendees who listened in today. We look forward to having you for future webinars. If we do not get to your question today, we will be replying, um, and we also have those resources for you that were mentioned throughout the presentation. Uh, so this concludes today's program. We hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you so much. <laughs>